This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at FilmmakerU.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at Filmmaker underscore U. Every week, we interview a film professional to discuss their work. And this week, I'm joined by Roger Neal, who's a composer, and his work includes 20th Century Women, Don't Think Twice, and more recently, Darby and the Dead. Welcome to the show, Roger. Thank you. It's, it's great to be here. Now, I want to talk to you about Darby and the Dead, but I do have a few questions about Don't Think Twice uh, as a fan of oh, that sure. movie. <laughs> um, yeah. So Mike Berbiglia, like anytime I've seen him uh, work on something or seen him interviewed about working on something, he's very uh, meticulous and takes his time to go through like the storytelling process. So what was it like working with him as a director in terms of figuring out what the sound is for Don't Think Twice? Yeah, that was a really fun. It's a really good process that was organic. Uh, I'll tell you a quick little backstory about how I got on the on the movie because it's pretty fun. Um, uh, the producer of the movie uh, is Ira Glass, who is both you know most well known uh, for his um, radio series This American Life, and I've always was a huge fan of that. Just loved to show, and I listen to it every weekend. And then one weekend, a few years back, a number of years back, I heard behind one of his stories some music of mine um playing in the background i'm like wow that was so cool like ira glass has chosen my music for some story like you know background music then a week later on another podcast uh there's more music of mine on this america life so i call my agent and i say hey wow this is so wonderful i just love this guy and he loves to my music uh what kind of royalties are we getting for this so what kind of licensing fee are we getting for this and um and uh, i was informed oh it's nothing because it's npr they can just use this stuff for free. So um, I, I just wrote a cold letter to the This American Life website and um, and said, hey, I'm a big fan of your show. It was, it was kind of funny, a funny, somewhat snarky letter. And I felt like I really had to, had to lift my game up in the way I wrote this because Ira is such an erudite, interesting, funny, literate man that I really wanted to kind of like... Um, you know, write a letter that was up that level, having no intent idea that he would actually, you know, read it. Anyway, the letter was essentially, hey, I love your show and you apparently, apparently like my music. Do you know I'm not getting paid for, for this? Um, uh, you know, I do this for a living. Uh, maybe you could hire me. And he calls me up on the phone and says, yeah, we're going to hire you right now. So um, that, that started that relationship. And it was really fun. Well, it turns out that the reason that Ira used my music on This American Life is because his buddy, Mike Birbiglia, was a fan of my score to Beginners. And it was actually Mike that, that turned me on, to, turned Ira on to my music. And uh, and the two of them made um, Don't Think Twice Together, essentially. It's Mike's film, but Ira produced. So they really brought me on board. And and it's, it's, really, it's really great to start a project with that kind of... Uh, um, good feelings you know i didn't have to sort of sell myself they were they were on board for me uh uh working with them and uh so that was good and uh you know i got to meet them and 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 had fun and then there was a secret kind of um formula for how i figured out how the score should sound which, which is um it's always nice when it works out this way so don't don't think twice is a film about um improv comedians kind of like um uh, groundlings kind of kind of group and um they have in in this film they have like a, their own theater space and and they do the, these shows and they teach improv but they're kind of like in the very lower end of the entertainment world hierarchy like they're kind of at the very bottom and that's sort of what the show is about like the people who are who are in showbiz but just kind of barely in showbiz um on screen you kept we kept seeing in in this improv theater uh a person playing piano in the background and um kind of like riffing stuff and he's never introduced and he's never explained who he is but I, I made up this whole story to myself that this pianist in the background is their old friend from college and he's just sitting there like improvising kind of poorly like the guy who played at their at their frat parties and and there he is so um I ended up sort of when I designed the score I sort of um used him as my um alter ego and I made a score that would be sounding like as if this guy 
was playing piano throughout the entire movie. Uh, Ira had a, had a notion that since the movie, this um, don't think twice, is about improv, improv comedy, that the that the score could maybe be jazz because that's you know an improv improvisational medium, and I I suggested no, that wasn't the right way because these these folks in this movie weren't at that level of sophistication in a way like they weren't just they weren't jazz fans i just didn't see them as jazz fans i saw them as more like uh uh well just not, not jazz so anyway um he bought that and that's how that's how that score came about with like a, a kind of a nasty sounding piano that sounded good and nasty at the same time and just kind of like um uh just like playing the emotions as if someone's in the background of every scene just playing piano to, to what's going on um with the dialogue so that was fun it was like a really organic kind of like sensible way to approach that score i'm going to interrupt this interview for one second we want to thank pixel view one of our sponsors they're a streaming solution for filmmakers pixel view lets you stream your work to remote clients for easy collaboration and it works with both on-set teams and post-production teams with built-in video chat you can discuss and make changes in real time and stream directly from your editing software or you can use the hardware encoder to stream from DaVinci Resolve or the camera on set. See the promo code and the link in the video description below. I do want to get to uh, Darby and the Dead. So how did you get involved with that project? I'm assuming it wasn't through uh, This American Life again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Or was it? Um, well, it's interesting, you know, for those your listeners, I, I assume a lot of them are, are also film, film people. And, and uh, a lot of what we do is like figuring out how do we, how do we get the next job and how do we, you know, network to, to get our name out? So it's always, it's always interesting to kind of remember how everything happened, but this was different. I think so Darby and the dead was a super fun movie. I really enjoyed doing it directed by Silas Howard. And this is the second time I worked with Silas. So we'd worked before a few years previous on a film called um, a kid like Jake and that really went well. And it, that was a, a sort of a small film that um, I really, I really enjoyed doing, and um, got to know Silas, the director, quite well. And um, in fact, yeah, he's, he he spent a lot of time with me here in the studio. You're looking at behind me, just sitting, sitting on the couch, um, listening to me write music. And anyway, um, that was just just that went well, and um, he he convinced 20th century studios that produced kid like, uh, excuse me, that produced Darby and the dead to bring me on board. That was a bit of a process. Cause this is Darby and the dead is, was a, it's a much bigger film and uh, it's a studio film. And there's a lot of cooks involved, but that's, um, that's what brought me on board. And, and again, fortunately I had uh, a relationship with the director and had a, had a working style that was already established. That made the process easier, not easy, but easier. What was, because you said it was a fun process. So what, what was, or a fun film to work on? What made it so fun? Well, so Darby and the Dead is um, a film about, uh, it's a high school film about ghosts. And there's a, very much a supernatural element to it uh, about ghosts. Our heroine is able to communicate with ghosts. <laughs> Our heroine is able to communicate with ghosts, and um, but more than that, it's actually just kind of like a teen drama about uh, uh, teen relationships and about growing up. And in many ways, it's well, it is certainly the least scary ghost movie you're going to see this year. These ghosts are, are benevolent creatures; they they don't they don't frighten you. Um, but they're they're a force that our heroine has to reckon with. And in many ways, I think the supernatural element, the idea of these ghosts. Who are having a hard time passing into the afterlife that's their that's their conflict that this is really a, a metaphor for growing up and 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 moving on with your own life so there's all these wonderful elements to to play with as a composer there's a supernatural kind of magical stuff um and it's kind of like crazy hijinks that happen within that notion and then there's a there's sort of the more dramatic teen ox type of things there's some really cool like um rock pieces and hip hop pieces that I had fun writing and uh, there's a bit of a romance. And uh, so there's like lots of, lots of fun touchstones to, to riff on with the music. So how did you figure out, cause you talked about 
you know, in uh, Don't Think Twice, looking at like seeing the piano and that sort of influenced you or gave you an idea of where to go. So how did you figure out the sound for, for Darby? Yeah, for Darby. Well, um, it's a good contrast because Don't Think Twice just seemed to fit into place. It just, you know, was, it just was sort of obvious in a way. Darby and the Dead required much more exploration. And that's that's sometimes the case. It's, it's not, it's nothing to do with the, um, you know, the the nature of the film just sometimes requires more of a struggle. Um, and, and Darby and the Dead was a long process uh, to write that score. The original notion that was um, presented to me by the studio and the filmmaker is that they wanted, we wanted to make a really colorful, magical orchestral score. Um, not exactly like, but in the same ballpark as say Harry Potter. Um, a lot of flourishes and just like fun hijinks. And then, and that seemed like a good idea. So, and I wrote a bunch of the score with that in mind. And I was very happy with it. And the studio was very happy with it until a certain point where we all sort of like looked at it in context and we realized, hmm, this doesn't quite feel right as an attitude because it was too, it was too colorful. It was too rich. And the, um, the crucial flaw with that approach, which we've ended, ended up changing, the crucial flaw was that I was playing music towards the more supernatural elements of the score or, or to the story. And in fact, the really important thing is the uh, to the story turns out to be the um, the emotional parts and the relationships between these characters and more of the teen drama. So we totally um, did an about face and reconceptualized the score to uh, to a different sound altogether, which was much less orchestral, much more um, sort of hybrid hip hop, um, sort of goofy, weird sounds and and interesting. Um, and, and guitars and it's like in, an interesting sort of like fresh palette of, of uh that, that was not necessarily something you'd associate with any kind that was super, any kind of story that was supernatural that took some effort but but um after it's all said and done it ended up being absolutely the right choice and the score to this movie now i think is very unique and very fresh and fits the movie just beautifully now you talk about making like it's an orchestral uh score uh, did you guys actually record with an orchestra and like set something up or did you do it through, because nowadays we can do it through synths and uh, other tools on the computer. So how did you approach uh, creating the sound? Like it was, was it, uh, I guess, digital or uh, real? Well, it was going to be an orchestral score and we, and we did the about face. So it ended up not being it. We recorded a lot of live instruments. Um, but the thing is, uh, for composer, I mean, we had this wonderful orchestral session, uh, week of session set up at Abbey Road Studios in London. This is like, it, it doesn't get any um, more uh, classy than that. And I was so looking forward to recording that. But then, as I said, we decided to to drop that and go to a different direction. So um, it ended up being what you might call a homemade score by by design. Like we were, we, the when we did the about face, it was an interesting lesson for me. When we did the about face of how we're going to change the score, it just needed to become more and more intimate and and smaller in in a way, smaller and and a bit more focused. So um, so yeah, so um, it really ended up being like as if like a bunch of indie rock musicians were in a band just kind of kicking stuff around. Well, what's interesting is like I think about because you talked about Abbey Road there. And um, like, I think about the old recording studios and how they had to do things in an analog way. So, um, you know, Motown, for example, ha had a whole system set up in their attic. So when you clapped in the upstairs, it would create an echo in the attic and record that to the track. So when you're creating sounds do you, or music, do you prefer it to have the more analog feel of like, we want to get the echo in the room or do you prefer... Uh, doing it in the Pro Tools session uh, after recording sort of a clean track? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, this really depends on what we're trying to accomplish. Um, here in my studio, as you, as, as you can see on, on your Zoom here, I have lots of instruments and I play lots of instruments and I really enjoy um, playing live instruments for my scores. But also a lot of the 
I also have lots of wonderful old synthesizers that, that I take advantage of on all my scores. And some of the some of the film scores that I'm best known for have a kind of analog synthesizer sound, uh, specifically um, 20th century women. So I don't have a strong preference. The the preference is to find the approach and find the musical attitude that fits the story the best. And that's a whole journey. Um, trying to find that sound. Um, any given film score, or most scores, I think, I hope this is a true statement, I think it is, if you have 40 minutes of music in a film score, or if you see a film that has 40 minutes of music, it's pretty likely that that composer has written about 400 minutes of music, but you just keep re coming back and trying different things and trying different things um, and landing on the sound that feels unique and fresh and exactly right for the project at hand. Okay, so that that gives a very interesting question then. If there's 400 minutes, do you think, so you remember how when DVDs were popular, be like, here's alternate cuts, here's alternate scenes. Do you think they should release, like, here's the full, like, orchestra? Or do you think, like, nope, that's got to stay private? <laughs> that was me experimenting and hiding stuff. Well, I don't know about that. It's funny because, you know, oftentimes the filmmakers in the studio will will feel a little bit guilty for having the composer write 400 minutes of music and they'll say oh just use that other stuff for some other project it never works that way you know it's like you it's it's like saying um i don't know redecorating a house and say oh just just use that same stuff for another house you're redecorating no each each one is a separate thing so it's just it's just part of the process you know I, um there's a I think all composers go through that. Even, you know, the greats in the classical era, they would have tons and tons of notes that were just like showing like the whole process and all the stuff that they abandoned. And it's just how, this is how it goes sometimes. I, I wish I could reuse that, but, uh, but I don't. And only, I mean, as far as like re-releasing it, occasionally you'll see something like that. It was really interesting. For example, if you have a composer who's scored an entire movie and they're done, and then maybe that score gets tossed. That has happened in some, in some famous cases and replaced by something else that might be worth hearing one example that comes to mind is um 2001 a space odyssey the kubrick film from the from 69 i think there was a an actual score that was written by alex north for that movie um and he scored the whole movie whole whole film and, it, and then that score was tossed and the kubrick replaced that music with uh with classical music and only fairly recently has Alex North's original score emerged and it's interesting it's an interesting just to see like what um what he came up with and maybe figure out why it didn't work for Kubrick it seems like such a Kubrick thing to do <laughs> to be like you know what we're gonna do the whole thing you know what let's start again let's just scrap everything <laughs> oh the story gets even worse because apparently legend has it that Alex North showed up to, to the premiere not knowing his score was tossed oh uh, man yeah what a painful oh, that must have done. yeah Jeez. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I have one last question for you. What would you say is your favorite guilty pleasure film or TV show to watch? Oh, I have so many. You know, um, right now this this time of year is the is the awards season, so I'm watching all these movies at home uh, to vote on for the Academy Awards. But sometimes I I just get sort of tired of dumb, of like watching something that I don't know, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll I'll grab one of those movies that just is is comfort food. Um, and I have a few of them. Last week, for example, I watched Moneyball for like the 12th time because I just love the score and I just love the movie. Um, that's one. I think Love Actually, it's Christmas time. I just probably watched that 20 times. It's just, it's just a fun movie with also a beautiful score. And uh, and probably the last guilty pleasure comfort food thing that I watch is the the Godfather movies just I keep returning to them over and over and over again because there's just so much story to find even though you've you've seen it over and over there's like so many nuances that I just I enjoy watching it watching those movies as simply a fan of movies now is love actually your go-to Christmas movie or is it just one of the go-to Christmas movies well I'll watch it I'll, I'll watch it year-round <laughs> <laughs> I'll watch it year-round but but I tell you people 
there there are certain moments musically which I love, and and i you know this is the time of year to watch it if if, if your listeners you know are, are feeling it. I think my favorite musical moment is when um, Colin Firth he 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 at the end towards the end of the movie he returns to Portugal to uh, to woo this woman that he is. Um, fall in love with he kind of like realizes he's fallen in love with her and and he's marching through uh this this town with all the townspeople following him as he goes to propose to this woman and it's just a wonderful like five minute piece of music that that um the composer i think was craig armstrong uh wrote and just it's it's just best it's just like really just works great well thank you so much for letting me interview today thank you it's fun to talk to you yeah. And that's it for this week, everyone. Make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com or of course on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs.